other ones to also upload so those will be going up next week as well so with that we can jump right into it hey Raphael. hi there everyone hey nice yeah. having you on <laughs> yeah thanks you thank you for doing this and stopping by um a lot of people were very excited to have you on um and they had a lot of it's questions right for you yeah um nice. so <laughs> i think the first thing that we can jump into is just like a little bit of a introduction about um you and then what you do and then we can get into kind of the rest of it yeah sure um for those who don't know me um i'm a 3d artist based in ludwigsburg germany and i usually most of people that know me on the internet probably think of shading and photorealism when they hear my name because that's what i'm after most of the time <laughs> So I do like um, photorealistic lighting and shading and um, probably I'm while a bit too deep into the physics side and maybe a little bit too less into the art artistic side of it, but uh, I really love the physics of uh, the realistic and realism and uh, yeah, of, of the material background and I... Um, well, in terms of what I do is I work on normal, occasional um, product visualization and stuff like that. So I'm basically not very different from you all. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and uh, so basically I do also my um, spare time works in the mean, in the, in the time where I have some down time where I don't do jobs and in those th those are mostly small pieces of work like um, a desk setup and stuff like that where I try to make them as photorealistic as possible so for example I shaded a keyboard that I designed or I do some uh, a still life for example stuff like that yeah. yeah so and if you have any more questions <laughs> about what I do and uh what i think about stuff then you can let me know in the comments or in the <laughs> yeah in the chat in um, the chat yeah that's the i'm word. sure most people are very familiar with your work um especially in our space i feel like um when i said that you were coming on the stream most people are like wow what a like a big name's coming on so right um, yeah i think most <laughs> people are familiar um if anyone's not they can obviously you have a little hashtag under your name that they can go look at some of your instagram stuff or go to your website yeah that's great um, and so another thing is just, I'm always curious about, um, how people kind of got into the work that they do now. So did you go to school for this or what was kind of your intro into like doing more of this, like the work that you're doing now? Yeah, it's a funny story. I <laughs> didn't go to school for that. I'm uh, self-taught mostly. Mm. So when I was younger, um, the first introduction to, um, let's say, artistic use of a computer came from my brother. <laughs> He's a graphic designer. Okay. And he uh, he lived with his father, so we didn't live together. And hmm. um, when I visited him, uh, I he, he introduced me to Photoshop. He sat me down on his computer, mm -hmm. or I was interested in computer stuff anyway, so yeah. we I at the time didn't have a computer of my own or we, our family didn't have one. So he sat me down and taught me some basics like load in a picture and then just use the paint tools to paint <laughs> and stuff and like that, stuff like mm -hmm. that. So <laughs> I was, I think, nine years at the time and um, I, I had great fun doing this. Uh, it's nothing... Uh, related to 3D or something, mm -hmm. but it's like the first uh, touching of like a computer work, and arts, yeah. Of a computer and arts, yeah. And like the first thing I did was load in an image he um, scanned in because back then there were no di digital cameras. <laughs> yeah. And uh, like I, I put bullet holes in some walls <laughs> and like shattered some glasses. That mm -hmm. like it was a picture of like. Uh, a house or something so I, I made it like a this po post-apocalyptic scene <laughs> well yeah, i must like i have to search for it i think i still have it somewhere on on a floppy drive <laughs> oh wow yeah that'd be a good throwback post <laughs> yeah 
But yeah, a couple of years later, I I did get into computing on my own. So I had my own computer. It was very slow back then because I had no money to buy anything fast. And like the funny story is that I wanted to have a soundtrack burned on CD, uh, so copied for, from a friend of mine. Mm. And I didn't know how to do it. So he said, yeah, just uh, put your other CD in and then just click the icon. And I clicked the icon and it burned something on the CD. And then I took it back home. And when I put it into my um, disc player, so it was like a rack with a player, mm. it showed me a 70-minute track, but there was nothing on it. So <laughs> I put it into my computer and it was a list of software ripped software that, uh. that was on there so instead of copying the disc that i wanted to which was music <laughs> i accidentally copied what he was copying before and uh. that was like <laughs> the, the list of ripped software now i was going through the list and there was even more funny enough there was like 3e studio max was one of the first entries uh, because it's three and mm. like at the, the top alphabet. of the list, yeah. Right, yeah. So so I, I tried to install it. And back then, I didn't know anything about computers. So uh, it asked me whether I want to run the program on the CPU or on the GPU, so I, or if I had an acceleration GPU installed. And I thought, well, well why not? <laughs> Just click that. <laughs> And so when I uh, then installed, was fin the install was finished and I opened it, it instantly crashed. And oh, yeah. there was no way to get reverted back to the other option. Uh -oh. I, at least I didn't know, maybe uninstall and reinstall it. But I was young and foolish, so <laughs> I thought, well, that program isn't running very well. <laughs> so I got deeper down the list and some, some, list, uh, some topics below there was Cinema 4D and that just ran out of that's like, so with funny no, no issues <laughs> so if if i just made one uh one choice a little bit different i might be a 3d studio max user now. yeah in an alternate <laughs> universe there is alternate a Raphael universe. who has 3d you have every different version of software like a maya Raphael that does something in a different alternate universe <laughs> yeah. just based on installing software <laughs> that's funny so it's and it's just like worked such, yeah it just worked it was you didn't even have to install it. It just was like an exe file that you double clicked and it worked. Oh, wow. So, which uh, then, version was that? I think it was version four or version oh, five. I'm, I'm not sure anymore, but like some somewhere around there. Wow. So it like yeah, back then it was crazy. You had like this version of Cinema 4D where you had to. Um, there was no like you you had um, splines. And if you want to make an object out of the spline, the spline was gone and the object was there. So you had to duplicate the spline and oh then make God. the object. And the least like uh, like um, parametric had, version of it. <laughs> you had, had one undo, so mm. no more. So you could go <laughs> one step back and that was it. So <laughs> you had like, if, for example, if you wanted to, to do a lathe maps or something, you had to beforehand think about how many sub-steps, how many uh, in-between <laughs> steps you wanted to have. And if it was wrong, you had one undo. And if you screwed that up, <laughs> everything was gone. You had like the wrong uh, sub-steps and you had to uh, do, it, do it from a new. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. So many stuff that we just like take for granted yeah. as we like, oh, this software is like, crashing a little bit but it's like all this stuff running under the hood that we don't even like think about i think i joined cinema it was like 15 so like 11 right. iterations after the one that you <laughs> yeah. had opened that's crazy yeah the funny thing is that i still have like i recently run across a uh, version 4 and it's still running on the computer that's you could crazy. still open it and like with the 4k screens it's like filling up a tiny <laughs> rectangle on the top of right. your screen it's you, it's like this big yeah uh, yeah it's like this on your screen and <laughs> the rest of your screen is just other stuff <laughs> but like uh, uh interestingly enough the interface still looks very similar it's like the wire white uh, windows 95 style but mm. like you have the material manager on the bottom on the right side you have all the tools uh, on the left side on the right side you have 
I think some object manager. So mm -hmm. it's like basically the same <laughs> as right now. That's cool. So with right. that, did you like, um, how long was that between like when you first started your on like the ripped copy to like until you got kind of doing more right, of like right. the work that you're doing now? What was like kind of the process evolving from there? It's it was a very long process because back then I didn't know shit about anything <laughs> computer. Yeah. So uh, I had to learn about all the stuff that comes with computers. And back there, there was no internet or almost no internet. There was no YouTube and no uh, 3D dedicated help sites and stuff <laughs> like that. So I had to read the fucking manual. Sorry, I, I'm not sure. If <laughs> yeah, you can. Yeah, it's <laughs> if fine. you can curse. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I did that and uh, learned something out of it, not all by a long shot, but uh, then I got into a company where I did an internship and they were design oriented. Um, I was very design biased because of my brother, because he mm. um, influenced me a lot and did uh did a lot like classical design so he he designed like logos and brochures and stuff mm -hmm. like that so yeah I, I i applied for this internship and i got it but i was really interested into 3d and they had much faster computers than i okay. did so yeah. I, I used that and told them to hey i could do do some 3d for you if you want to and maybe you get more uh, wider client uh uh, what's it called? Glind, um, like base. Yeah, just yeah, like client base. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I I did that. I also did graphic design, but I never excelled at it. I wanted to be good, but I never <laughs> was very good at it. So yeah, that was kind of my start too. Is I I wanted right. like I started making logos and like I could like do it, but I just like pref I just like leaned way more towards like motion and 3D. So it's funny that you kind of got an internship. And then, like, made them let you teach yourself 3D <laughs> kind of on the yeah, job. Yeah, something along those lines, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, the there were two chefs, or there was one uh, woman and one, one man that were both uh, co-CEOing um, co the uh, company. And he was always very open. And she was always, no, no you, you have to learn a little bit of graphic design, too. <laughs> mm. And actually, I'm very thankful for that because uh, it's uh, all um, all a uh, visual thing. Yeah. So if you do motion graphics and or 3D in general, uh, you always uh, can can um, draw from what you learned before. Mm -hmm. So if that's like design is design, no matter what medium you use it in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, art fundamentals right. kind of cross go across yeah. like everything like it's always like good base to have like even if you don't think it will like apply it normally can in some area of like yeah like, even exactly. like painting textures or like designing where like stickers or decals go on stuff at all yes yeah, like, so very visual. often you have to just design decals and stuff mm -hmm. like that so it's very nice to know at least some fundamentals of yeah. design mm -hmm. so after that i was applying at a um, school for graphic design uh, so that's the only education i have in that um, direction so actually mm. it's like i went even more in that uh, direction to go to to graphic design and do some logos and stuff like that and one of the reason was back then i still wanted to do it but also the weren't a lot of other options to learn 3d there was mm. like at least uh, back then there were not a lot of schools that ta taught that and um, there were some some uh, private schools but they were really expensive you you had to pay like i don't mm -hmm. know 40 40 thousand deutsche mark back then not euros <laughs> 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 but yeah it's like and yeah that that was a three-year um school i don't know if it's like it's not a university mm. it's like in germany it's called hochschule or like uh yeah. Is it like, what? Like, how old were you during it? Um, 
probably uh, so beginning of twenty, something like that. Okay, so like around so college school, years, yeah. but yeah, not exactly college or university. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I don't know the term in English for it, but yeah, <laughs> I, I went there to uh, for three years and uh, graduated, and uh, so that's the only graduated graduation I have. So I'm a uh, what's it called? Like it's um staatlich geprüfter graphic designer it's the german term but like it means uh, i have the proof from the state to practice graphic design so <laughs> oh, kind of like a like a bfa i think or similar to like right, a bachelor's yeah. sort of thing where it's like you studied for this amount of time and you can show that to employers and stuff so did you get a job out of that in graphic design no i never went into no. graphic design so <laughs> <laughs> But like I used uh, every every opportunity during the the time to do 3D. So mm. whenever the the task I was assigned to was not specified <laughs> close enough, I did the the thing we could do in 3D. So. Okay. <laughs> So, like, design a logo. It never stated you couldn't do that in 3D. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and like sometimes it was like and um do an ad campaign for some product and so i made a 3d animation instead of mm. and, <laughs> instead of like a poster or something yeah. like that yeah it's very <laughs> similar because like my school didn't we just had like digital media was like what it was called so like it wasn't yeah. really folk there weren't many teachers that i think they were teaching they had one class that was Lightwave <laughs> is what they oh, were teaching okay. in like 2013 um, which seemed like out of date already. And so I was like, yeah. oh, just do all of this in cinema. And so for kind of similar stuff where it's like if you could bend the rules. And I think that that was like a good thing because it kind of gave you like tasks to do and like things to teach yourself inside the program because it's kind of hard to think of stuff to teach yourself if, and like discover different things inside a program if you don't have like a set task to do. So is yeah, that kind of like, that's kind of how you learned and taught yourself was just through like different school assignments and stuff like that? Or well, just like... yeah, that, and but all, I was very into like very hardcore into 3D. So I, I sat at the computer day and at night. So <laughs> I was like, when I, I was at the, at the school uh, during daytime. And when I came home, I was at the computer till like four o'clock or something in the night. So there were weeks where I only only slept like three hours a That's night. Crazy. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I I overdid it back then. I, <laughs> I because right now, like there in my twenties and uh, to the end of my twenties, I I was really not like having a lot of sleep so i i just shrank down the time i slept and uh, wanted to increase my productivity but now it like caught up to me so mm. i really have to sleep eight hours a, yeah. a day or i feel terrible <laughs> yeah but i mean it's also those are the kind of is when you can do it is like i feel like in your early 20s like call it like yeah. you're actually capable of like investing that much energy and then it slowly at least more capable yeah Maybe There's not the healthiest people thing out to do. There that yeah that, that can uh, get away with uh, like a lot less sleep than I do, and I really uh, envy those people because <laughs> I just want to be more productive. But my body says no, you have to sleep now. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, but uh, where were we? So the oh, so the uh, yeah, you were like uh, you graduated and you didn't go into doing graphic design, but like. From all the right, 3D right, you yeah. taught yourself. So, yeah, during this time, I, it was really intense in terms of, like, how many hours I sit, sat on a computer and did stuff. And I just, it was the, the greatest time. It felt like a bit of Wild West because mm. I didn't really know where all of this were, was going. But still, I was discovering something new every day mm. in, to, in the 3D software. Yeah. And it was like the best playground you could have. And I actually got enough material together because I did a lot of renders and testing and stuff to, to cut a reel. Hmm. And I, before the, uh, the school ended, so before there was like the graduation, I sent out my reel to different companies that work with Cinema 4D and I 
actually got uh, very positive feedback because back then it wasn't that common to have like people doing 3D. Uh, mm. Like nowadays, if you tell someone, well, I started doing 3D when I was maybe, I don't know, 15 years old, they say, yeah, what, yeah. what of it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, Everyone but back does, then yeah. it was like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's even like 10 year olds that do mm -hmm. it or even younger. I don't know. But yeah, uh, back then it was like not that common. It, like there were other people, but uh, also like usually you were like in your own uh, sort of bubble because mm. the, like the chats have uh, popped up in the internet, but usually you, you didn't find people that with the with a hobby as you have with 3d and mm. so it was a time where you didn't know if there how many other people there were around you that had the same hobby and the same interests and yeah. like to come together and meet up and stuff like that it's much more easy nowadays <laughs> yeah it's it's nice um so, so yeah, then you yeah. went to work somewhere um doing yes purely exactly. like exactly like commercial work or was it um, just like kind of anything 3D? No, it was um, like I went to Munich after that. I was um, there um, and I, I like I never was employed. I like I wanted to be employed, but everyone told me no. Uh, they It was like during the, the crisis, the, the first like the big crisis and I don't know, 2000 and four or two or mm. I don't know <laughs> yeah. my my brains all over the place but <laughs> yeah so like the, the the crisis were and they they didn't want to take risks so they didn't want to employ me but they offered me a job as a freelancer so I accepted that and I moved to Munich and worked for this one company for a time and it was very intense. So it was the first job, and they were they know they knew that they got a good guy and a guy that really wants perfection, and they just used that. Oh. <laughs> I was like, it was really intense. I had like eighty-hour weeks and stuff like that there. That's crazy. Yeah, and like with a very very minimal income, um, I. Like I had to pay rent and Munich back then, even back then it was like really high prices, mm. not nothing compared to New York, but <laughs> <laughs> still very high. Uh, so I had to pay my, my rent and pay my train ticket and stuff like that. So I had to really, um, really uh, keep my money together to have enough money to get, uh, buy something to eat at the end of the month. Mm. <laughs> so it's, Wow. was really really hard and while uh while having those massive work times mm -hmm. so after i think it was only like uh two-thirds of a year i said no screw it that's <laughs> because they always told me no no that's normal Every, right. everyone works like that <laughs> yeah and yeah so i was going back to the company where i made the internship and mm. It was a different part of Germany. It's like southern Germany. Well, Munich uh, is also southern Germany, I guess, but uh, like uh, it's 200 kilometers or so apart. So I moved back there and started to work there, and it was much better. The jobs were not as high profile as they have been in Munich, but uh, working conditions were much nicer, and it actually they, I had enough free time to learn and do stuff on my own because when you work that long shifts you mm -hmm. don't learn anything new right. you just just do uh, you kind of maintain your yeah. and maintain and <laughs> yeah so when i got back there it was uh yeah breath uh what what do you call it uh breath of fresh air and mm -hmm. like suddenly yeah. you could exhale and yeah. just relax a bit yeah and so, yeah, I, I tried to go to the Film Academy Baden-Württemberg. So it's like a university, a very uh, well-known university for, for film and 3D animation. Mm -hmm. So when I wa wa worked there, I had enough time to prepare for that. So I trying to apply there and the first uh, application failed. So I <laughs> wasn't, wasn't taken. 
and then I applied the second year after that and actually that time I was taken and I went to Ludwigsburg where I still am mm. <laughs> and um, but I uh, noticed really quickly so after half a year maybe um, being on the campus that that's not for me anymore because mm. uh, like now I worked in Munich then I worked two years in, in the other place and yeah. I really also got my own clients and then uh, going back studying uh, w was a bit difficult for me mm. uh, also because of the first two um, years you do some basic stuff like learning everything film related it's good oh, okay. but but you have to write um write your own uh what's it called like scripts for movies and you oh, have you it's to, like very film focused yeah yeah you have to do the camera and some productions and stuff like that so mm. after that you go into your own um like into a section of the university that's called film uh, um, animationsinstitut uh, where you then are off to the animation part of it. Uh, mm. But it takes almost two years to get there, and I didn't want to... <laughs> be a lot of downtime away from, like, the momentum you had just come right, off of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And also it was, like, um, it's very elite there. You, like, mm. you have, like, very... Uh, you have a lot of... of um, what's it called? Like, appointments where, where you have to be there and... Um, Normally, if you go studying, you always have in your mind that you, you're doing party and have a lot of free time, <laughs> but yeah. that certainly not, doesn't apply there. So you, like very strict. Very strict, and you have like even um, some some lectures on Saturdays and stuff like that. So, oh, wow. So yeah. School, it, a lot of school. A lot of school, yeah. So uh, I like I wanted to... I, I had to finance it myself, and it's a state, uh, stately, I don't know what it's called, a, like an official university where you don't have to pay for anything, mm. but still you have to pay for your home and you have to pay for food and stuff like yeah. that. Of course, not no one pays for that, <laughs> so I had to to do jobs in the in the spare time where I didn't study, and the spare time was so minimal that I didn't. Uh, have time to squeeze everything into that time so mm. i lost money and i thought hmm, that's not really good to, yeah. to have debts at the end of the uh of the university so i i canceled that and mm. uh, went freelance again <laughs> so, yeah, so you had already gotten clients at that point so how did those come about did people just like see your reels and stuff or was it like from the different places you had worked yeah, it was mostly like it really paid off that I was so so focused on 3D and like it was like I was on crux. I did <laughs> like all the time I, I experimented around and um, rendered stuff and wanted to make the, the best looking 3D renders like I guess everyone wants. Yeah. <laughs> and then I... Um, when I had enough material, I always did cut reels from that. Mm. Uh, so those reels show maybe 1% of my actual commercial work and like the rest is just experiments and like mm. small sequences yeah. I, I did uh, to train myself and experiment. So yeah, I'm like in like, uh, I don't know, maybe I made four reels in, in my life, but the first two were very successful because a you didn't have the hardware to uh as a single artist um to to render anything that looked quite good uh, back in the time mm -hmm. i really used the computer strength of the office i was working in i i installed oh, okay. clients on every computer and then at the night i just rendered my stuff there so you built <laughs> so, yourself like a little render farm so that you could do yeah. your okay that makes sense that's fun so I, I asked them beforehand, of course, so, yep. hey, uh, do you mind if I install that software on your computers? <laughs> and uh, because I, I really could use your power and uh, at night when nobody's there. And I think they even had a flat rate for electricity, so they didn't mind. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, find find that nowadays. Uh, flat rate <laughs> for electricity, it's really hard. <laughs> so yeah, now uh, then I I got um, I was really known for my uh, very detailed and long intros into wheels. <laughs> Everyone said you shouldn't do that. Don't do long intros, but like my intros, I I see them as a part of the wheel itself or mm -hmm. themselves. Because they already show uh, very high end 3D. Well, back right. then, nowadays they look shit as everything I did back then. But <laughs> no, they, they hold up. They hold up well. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, that second reel that I cut, I think it was my second or maybe third one, the one with the robot um, uh, and the touch screen. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe some some of you uh, have seen it at the beginning at the intro that got me a lot of um at least requests online so i suddenly got requests from all over the world um hmm. telling me to hey i really like your stuff maybe uh you can work for us so there was this interesting uh request once in my in my mail when i opened it it, it um was an also from New York, <laughs> uh, coincidence here. <laughs> so uh, there was this nice guy uh, that uh, wanted to do a um, jewelry collection and mm. wanted to, he already had get, gotten into production, but there were no finished rings. He had bought the diamonds, he had bought the, the, um, the metals and stuff like that. So he contacted me to if I was able to reproduce the designs as a 3D render more or less realistic mm -hmm. so he could sell or pre-sell them to uh, potential clients and I said okay so I talked to the office we're working at the time and said hey I have a request from a client and <laughs> Can I can I take off every Friday to work on his stuff? And they were, yeah, sure, why not? Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, they were really open. <laughs> I I really loved those people there. So I just uh, worked over the weekends sometimes and on on Fridays for this client, and he was paying very well. So <laughs> that's how I made made the first b bigger money <laughs> and the first. Uh, yeah, steps where I where I noticed that you can could uh, actually make money with 3D and like mm. make a living. <laughs> yeah. Be because beforehand the time in Munich was very depressing, so I mm. did, I told myself I couldn't I don't wouldn't be able to do that until I'm 80, like <laughs> working 80 hours and yeah. like getting getting very little money from that. And the office and where I went back to the other company. There were great people, but the pay was very minimal. So mm -hmm. they paid what, like there there wasn't a lot of requests for 3D from them, and mm -hmm. I did 3D. So yeah, it it, it turned uh, it went well, but it wasn't something sustainable that I thought I uh, could do all the time. So yeah, when I first got like direct clients, I thought okay, that might be a thing to to pursue. Mm. so after that you kind of were able to like after the jewelry one and like more of your reels did more people just contact you for like freelance work where you there was enough pull that you could finally like go make like your own thing yeah yeah exactly so well i i did go study and then cancel that as i told yeah, you yeah and after that there were still some clients interested and um I just stayed in the shared apartment that I'm still in, <laughs> so I'm I'm still living in a shared apartment <laughs> with other other people. Mm -hmm. uh, I I stayed there and worked from there for maybe one and a half years, and then I got this office with a colleague of mine. He's doing the same thing, and it's really great because you can share your resources. We have like about mm -hmm. twenty graphic cards here in the office, wow. so if someone wants to render and uh, that's really nice you can use uh, all the graphic cards and usually the the um, the jobs are not getting in the way of each other so mm. if he has his crunch time I don't mind 
he taking the rest of my hardware to render and vice versa. So, yeah. <laughs> so where did um, Silverwing kind of come from as like the name or like pseudonym or artist name that you like right. started? Where did that come from along the process? It's it's not uh, as a great story as how I, I got into 3D. <laughs> So, sorry about that, but no, it's like okay. it was, I, I just wanted to have a nice name back then, mm. and it was still uh, at the time where I thought a lot more about logo um, creation and stuff like that. Um, so I don't know how it came to be uh, directly, but I know it was like on a train ride, and I thought about what would be my name to get known in the industry and then mm. suddenly that popped up that name popped up and it's like i stuck with it <laughs> so right like in the last couple of years um i always um also um introduce myself as rafael rau mm. because like it's a bit more personal to know my name yeah. uh, instead of just like this silver wing thing <laughs> you, you don't know who's behind that <laughs> it was also a weird but, part of the internet was like to it kind of went from like you don't put your name out on the internet for a long time so people had like right. names that they went by and then it switched over to like everyone should know your name as an artist and then it was like oh yeah all these people have like two <laughs> names to go by which i always thought was kind of funny true yeah um, before that i i was like known as framestorm <laughs> i ooh. don't know I, yes i don't know if there's like people that still know that name but that, there was the small 3D community, uh, German 3D community called 3D or 3D Ring. Hmm. It's like 3D Ring. Ah, okay. Yeah, and like there, my nickname was uh, Framestorm, but I changed <laughs> it afterwards. So <laughs> Silverwing is a little bit more catchy. <laughs> yeah, has maybe. that nice like, logo too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I really like sometimes I thinking of re redesigning it, but then I think of it's it's nice to have like something that people really know that mm. like um, I always get um, like when big companies redesign their logo, usually the, the, like people are upset because yeah. they <laughs> they're so used to the mm -hmm. logo, the old one. And it happened to me too i don't know like uh maybe five to ten years back ilm changed their logo a little bit and i was a bit frustrated too because <laughs> like i they had like this logo from the old star wars days and they never changed it and now like i don't know t 2005 maybe mm -hmm. they suddenly changed it and it looked kind of the same but similar and i i really wasn't happy with it but <laughs> A couple of years later, I look at it and I, I think, oh, that looks pretty good and modern, yeah. and it's not too much uh, mm -hmm. change to the old one, so it's it's still okay. <laughs> but maybe like it's it's like those videos where there, there's a family and the baby, and the dad um, shaves his beard and oh, the baby starts different. crying yeah. because <laughs> the dad is is uh, just suddenly looking different yeah mm -hmm. and not as uh, it's used to so <laughs> yeah maybe it's like this yeah people and, just don't but, like change like a couple of days later it's fine <laughs> mm -hmm. but yeah that was a long tangent <laughs> <laughs> yeah but I, I always think it's interesting to see kind of like the path that people take to get to like where they are now because it's so different across and like each person is like very yeah different and i think it's encouraging to anyone that's like thinking they're not going the right path to like do it because you kind of build up these things in your head of like this is how you get to like right. do what you want but it's like you can really come from anywhere and like not be doing it for like a long time and then just switch over and be like i want to get more into the like 3d or something and it's like even now with more information and like more resources it's much easier to kind of get into it versus like the old days back when you were like trying to like read manuals <laughs> and try to figure out like yeah. what things did <laughs> Yeah, yeah basically i learned 3d by just pushing buttons and see what's happening yeah <laughs> it was really tedious but back then i didn't mind i, mm -hmm. I like my mind was fresh and i was playful mm -hmm. yeah i think that, I, that i never would want to learn a software <laughs> like that again but <laughs> yeah. like right now <laughs> but back then it was no problem right it's kind of like the the wild west like you were saying when you were like it felt so open and like such a 
like a playground it's kind of i feel like a lot of that also comes before you use it as a job and you're like using it every day is like your work machine it's like less of a playground because you're kind of just maintaining and you're just like there to do a specific task and then like afterwards you're like if you want to stay around and like stay in the office and do it more i feel like it was a lot more in college days i was like more right. keen to do that and now it's more of like i have to kind of have a more set out plan versus just sitting here and like pushing buttons because i like in my head know what most of them do and it's a little, a little harder to like experiment um so i think that that's a good leeway in or uh flow into like your your work with personal projects which you've apparently been doing like that's kind of like how you did everything and how you taught yourself but um and it's in a lot of your reels too you have a lot of yes. like more personal <laughs> projects and do you think that That's those true. get you more work because you're kind of showing the stuff that you like to do and then you get client work that's similar to it um is that kind of like why you do yeah, the personal that's, projects yeah that's probably it uh so i noticed that you have to be a bit strict when it comes to requests because mm. i ended up sometimes doing like after effects 2d animations <laughs> because i wasn't strict enough mm. and people noticed i could do that so they yeah. they just used me for it mm. but i i don't have fun doing that so <laughs> i wanted to put something out uh that people can see and resonate with and then come back to me and tell me basically yeah that's what i want for my my representation or my mm. work or my my uh, advertisement so i uh, don't want to put out 2D After Effects animation so because that creates this loop where you then get more of it and you want mm -hmm. to get rid of it. Yeah. So the best way I thought uh, was going about it, doing really what I love and just put out work that I do in my spare time and then just um, see what the reaction was. And actually mm -hmm. that's kind of what worked, what worked the best. And there's so little uh, client work in my portfolio because two, of two things. Uh, one, of course, when you do spare time work, you can polish it all you want and it's ready when you say it's ready. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. <laughs> and the other thing is that there's a lot of it under NDA, so I can't show it yeah. anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that was something I wasn't used to or wasn't expecting when I finally started like doing client work was that like a lot of the cool stuff you would do they'd be like and you can't show it and you're like oh so i do have to right. do personal projects to like fill this reel up because i don't have enough work to show at the end people are like what have you been working on and you're like can't really show you anything yeah can't even tell you <laughs> yeah um so what kind of got your like i know you you said that you were always trying to make just like the best looking like most <clears throat> photorealistic renders that you could but kind of i feel like you're also kind of the person that everyone looks to for like also the the scientific and like physically accurate so what kind of got you into that research of like looking up how to convert like scientific numbers into like the rendering numbers right right so i think it has something to do with like how i how i approach things mm -hmm. because i'm not a very experimental person in in the sense of like i'm i'm i don't maybe have the best eye for catching things if they're wrong or something like that mm. so if i look at something uh i might like there's this those pictures where you have like a lot of things going on and there's some funny thing going on and like everyone if, if someone at the office showed that into a couple a round of people Everyone starts laughing while I still search the picture for what, what was funny about that. Uh. So I guess th that's like some some good um, hint for why I do it the scientific way because um, science is a very strong pillar to lean on. And the more you know about it, the less you have to really think about or like have to exhaust your brain what's wrong with the with the render because mm. you know that when you put in those values there's only one outcome and that's the thing like in reality so of course it's a good thing to not be too strict about it because there's also creative freedom and you mm -hmm. can like 
deviate from that. I totally get that, and I do it myself, uh, especially if clients tell me that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that they want the reflection to be stronger. I like there's no point getting into an argument that the <laughs> Fresnel is not right, <laughs> not Physically allowing for based, that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you, you somehow have to do take compromises now every now and then but if in my my um, spare time works i really trying to respect the the physics and of course a renderer also never is like 100 mm -hmm. percent accurate there's like deviations and sometimes that's just bugs that snuck in and just uh for example don't uh, uh don't get the the diffuse uh when you have very rough materials don't have the right um diffuse value and stuff like that so but um yeah that's uh, that's basically it i really uh, use it as a as a pillar to hold on to to get stuff to look as realistic as possible because also when you going when you're getting more realistic and realistic in every scene you're doing uh, there's a point where you can't tell where where what factor is making the render hold back from realism or mm. from being more realistic there's like you you see that there's something off but you can't put your finger on it and basically those are the very small last five percent maybe and by tweaking or turning anything everything to to a physical workflow uh, i think that gets me closer to the to the point where you cannot distinguish that anymore but it's also funny like when you're working on a on a piece and you finish it and think well that worked very well that's the most realistic thing i've ever done and then five years later you look <laughs> at it you notice all the the things that could could be better because like uh, technology has advanced in the time <laughs> yeah so is it yeah. a lot harder to like i mean now we have like pbr workflows which are more based on like what we should be using and like a lot easier to convert the numbers but like when you were trying to do it back in the day was it all just by eye or were there still some scientific like ior and like that sort of stuff and like just different things you could plug in but everyone kind of treated it differently per like i mean render yeah. engines but software as well Back in the day, like in, in Cinema 4D R4, there was no IOR, yeah. I think. <laughs> it was it's like, like a reflection just... slider that goes from zero to one. Mm. But uh, like, I think I, I did a long, um, I, I spent a long time uh, using V-Ray for rendering, and it mm. already had a lot of things that are still common nowadays, like the IOR. Mm -hmm. Back then, there there was uh, like nowadays there is a lot more that has to do with metallic shading um, that wasn't very common back then. So mm. like your metal shaders with yeah. edge tint stuff stuff like that. Uh, so you had to put your own shaders together mm. that made this basically uh, look like uh, what you have nowadays built into the shader, but. Mm. I guess it's was like more minute like you had to put more thought into the shader because there like there was no there was no presets that did right. that right now in redshift or arnold or something you can like you have to drop down with uh, 20 materials that you can <laughs> choose from but uh, back then uh, you, you had to know every single step in the in the way to get to your material that you have in your head or in front of you if you have the ref reference but yeah that's basically basically that and of course the the access to information was much more limited right now you mm. could ch search for pbr materials and you have like 200 sources yeah. telling you how to to do it back then there was like only like first there was no one so i had to really dig deep into like physics forums and mm. i didn't understand really because they basically talk in code or in yeah. like math formulas mm -hmm. and i was what the hell are they? <laughs> like if i ask how how do i put the the k value in and or the imaginary part into the ior formula they just 
pasted some bunch of math in there, yeah. like very complex math. And I, okay, well, <laughs> that might be the way, but I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, there was this one guy that did um, great tutorials for um, V-Ray and 3D Studio Max. That was Grant Warwick. I don't know. A lot of guys heard of him because they he really taught a lot of the the basics of materials uh, back then in mm. in connection to V-Ray, but in general also in in connection to physics. And that was that was really nice to to finally have a source where you right. can learn from and i don't know where he got this information from but <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah that that where that's where it it started to make uh sense to me and mm. uh like the funny thing is i i of course did before um did research before and like most of the things that he did w were the same as that I did. And I thought, oh, that's even more convincing then. So yeah. I didn't do anything wrong. Mm. He just, he just uh, on top of what I knew, had more information that I learned then. Um, yeah. So you started in V-Ray because that was that like the first render that you like started getting like more physical results out of? Yeah, basically I started in Cinema 4D render that, like Just still in there yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then there was a brief moment of physical renderer mm. uh, but then there was like this beta of uh, v-ray for cinema 3d coming out it was i don't know 2005 maybe or something and uh i i hooked uh, got hooked to it r really quickly because it was more photorealistic and it was more um it was faster than the internal rendering hmm. so it also was a lot more complica complicated if you have like the old v-ray settings menu of mm -hmm. the render it's like you can scroll down quite a lot of information with all the settings in there it's mm -hmm. like back then render was kind of rock and science but <laughs> There's a lot of like um, kind of all the switches that you have to flip before like the rocket can take off. That's what it felt like, like yeah, in the yeah, very exactly. early days of when I was using this physical render. There's like all the little gotchas that you got to like, oh, tweak this number and then set this number to this number and then like make sure that that's on. But this is off if you need it. Right, yeah. yeah. Basically, <laughs> like... back then with WeRay, you had like this DMC sampler with different um, GI methods, mm -hmm. a bit like Redshift is nowadays. Yeah. Um, and then, but back then you did, didn't have the render power to use brute force, like a brute force mm. GI. You had to have, you had to use like Iridian's cache or something mm -hmm. else. And you, for animations, and I was known to do animations, uh, you had to bake down the GI per frame and then blend between the frames and stuff like that. So you had to cache your GI beforehand. And then when something moved, if you moved an object, you had to recache it because of course the object yeah. wouldn't uh, be aligned with the, with the GI cache anymore. So lots of things to think mm -hmm. about. It's, it's like uh, gotten a lot more easy nowadays with uh, having like just placing stuff around yeah. the scene, setting everything up, and then just brute forcing through it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you kind of, you switch from V-Ray, and then did you go into kind of, because you use Octane, you were like using right. a lot of, and Redshift, um, but you seem to like kind of tested all of them at some point, just to like see yeah, what they're doing. Yeah, there was a point, and it was like at the, when was that? Yeah, basically there was this version of octane coming out no one knew about it it was like version and still in beta version 0.7 or something and the the guy that's programmed that that he spammed the forums hey we wrote a new render uh, might uh, you might want to to take a look at it and first the first few entries i really thought it was spam and <laughs> ignored them <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, like sometime later, I just tried it and it was holy fuck, it was fast. Yeah. So, like uh, back then, it was the code was very simple, and the more simplistic uh, code for a render is the faster it runs. And mm. like I had uh, 
GTX 570 at the time with a whopping 1.2 gigabyte of VRAM. <laughs> so I, I tried it on there and like I compared it to V-Ray. Uh, so back then the processors weren't as fast as nowadays, mm-hmm. but I, I had a dual core 3.0 gigahertz processor. I don't know the name of it, but it was like, 10 times as fast as this processor with wow. like everything uh, you, you had like caustics and mm-hmm. GI and everything turned on by default if you use past tracing and I was just blown away but that also lead me on it let me on a tangent to try other renderers because I thought maybe I was missing out all the time <laughs> just using V-Ray yeah. <laughs> so I just opened up about every renderer that came out for Cinema 4D and tried them and yeah, it, it was also a very, very nice experience because uh, I always compare it to um, learning languages. Mm-hmm. So if you if you have your mother tongue, if you use, for example, English, you know that language for your life. It's very easy to use. But then you learn a second language. Let's, <laughs> yeah. for the sake of it, let's use uh, German. It's very hard to, to mm-hmm. get to know German because it's... Uh, some kind very difficult language to learn but then you learn a third language and then you can compare uh, start to compare words and stuff like Mm -hmm. that as for example kindergarten or something that's the same in german as in english so it might be even uh, similar in other languages so the more languages you learn the more you can compare between them and even like no, okay, that's a Latin um, word that might be the same in France or mm-hmm. in Ital- Italian or in, in Spanish. So it's the same with renderers. They yeah. sometimes call stuff differently, but generally they all do the same. They sample pixels and they do it in a certain way. And sometimes there's stuff you never heard before because <laughs> the programmer thought, oh, I'm I'm having this idea. I'm trying yeah. to implement that. But Overall, it's it's like getting more and more globally in your brain to map features to to other features and other renderers. So that helped me a lot to understand what's even going on in different render engines and what they're doing and what's like. I'm always interested also in, in the way render engines behave behind the curtain mm. because it helps me to understand uh, problems better. Because sometimes yeah. you get flicker or you get like this concentric rings around your camera point of view and stuff like that. And if you know what causes that, it's much more easier to fix than just going around and, and just <laughs> randomly slide uh, sliders around until it goes away. <laughs> so what made you kind of stick with like the renders that are using now? Is it just like from your experience of looking at everything, you've like figured out which ones just work? good with your workflow or was it that you yeah like the fastest most realistic ones were what you went with pretty much that but uh, (laughs) pretty much my workflow but also my workflow is to get fast realism so it's like both of that yeah yeah and basically it's um octane i like octane a lot because it's um a spectral renderer it um has basically more colors at its, at its disposal than uh, the other renders or most of the other renders. Uh, but there are also, um, for example, for bigger scenes, I learned that Redshift is really reliable. So mm-hmm. I, I, the thing is, I only, not only for my, my artwork pieces, also for the requests I get, there's this is mostly product visualization with like table sized products i always call them table sized Mm. (laughs) like i seldom get like airplanes or cars or something like that and uh that they fit very nicely into the vram of the graphics card and um with a lot of like intricate material details i always thought that uh, octane looked better and I don't want to start a render war here. I use both Redshift and but They're and both Octane. just tools and, and, and they're both yeah, good and you can exactly. make great things out of all of them. <laughs> so I, I just uh, also use Redshift, but I use Redshift more when it comes to like larger uh, projects, larger mm-hmm. objects where you have like many polygons, or a lot more materials and yeah. very 
very uh, huge data sets. So yeah, and sometimes I like not for production, but for like my own um, private works, I, I use other renderers still. So I use sometimes Indigo because it's uh, one of the few renderers that has the Metropolis light transport mm -hmm. where you can generate caustics quite quite easily. It's still long render times, but mm -hmm. better than um, unidirectional pass yeah. places. So yeah, um, but yeah, that's like basically my 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 uh, idea behind that whole thing is just always use the render that does the job that you want to do uh, mm -hmm. to to its best uh, ability. We did get a question from Instagram that asked why you don't use Arnold very much. Is there any reason behind that, or just right, not, not as comfortable? <laughs> <laughs> That's mostly because of my hardware right now. Mm. So I'm still at uh, having a older i7 uh, eight core CPU. And mm. uh, Arnold, I know that it's also GPU now, but I still don't have RTX cards. I'm still using the um, the 1080 Ti's, mm. and Arnold heavily relies on the GPU. Yeah. Um, you can render on it, but it, it relies on the RTX. Um, so, yeah, it's just mostly hardware related. Um, I really like the approach that um, Arnold is doing with like it's you can basically do everything you want with mm -hmm. it because it's a versatile. But on the other hand, it's um, if you don't have the hardware for it, it's <laughs> it's basically a bit crippling to wait yeah. for your renders for for to finish yeah so i i'm very happy with uh, octane in that regard and of of course um with bigger projects it's more like redshift it can handle a lot of data so yeah in the last couple of days there was a new version for um, arnold out and i really i noticed that i i'm I was more interested because um, next year I want to really build a faster computer and I would have been able to do it this year, but my accountant said I should do it next year because <laughs> it's better for whatever. <laughs> so, so yeah, I want to want to go with the 64-core uh, Threadripper or anything mm. that comes out until then that's faster, let's say, and <laughs> maybe 3, 30, 90s or something like that. Well, if you can get your hands on them. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess that's also good when like to wait till next yeah. year. Maybe there's more availability mm -hmm. or none at all. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from the chat that says, "Did you build your own computer?" So I assume if you're building a wanting to build a new one, do you build them yourselves or do you like get someone to build them? I usually build them myself. So right now, they if you don't do water loop, uh, water cooling loops and stuff like that, it's really easy. And mm -hmm. like back then, when I started building computers, uh, you could end up with uh, parts that don't match together. But yeah. right now, if you know a little bit about it, uh, there's usually no problem getting getting everything working inside of a case like of course with like the new components so if you have a founder's edition 3090 mm -hmm. you should know that it's really huge and you have to have the case for it and mm -hmm. the the airflow and stuff like that but if you just into for a smaller gaming computer or something you there's no problem uh building a computer it takes a bit of time and a bit of technical knowledge but it's not wild <laughs> yeah I, that's me saying that i don't know <laughs> yeah it seems a lot easier now i mean i remember like my first one i did like a couple of years ago it seems very daunting but once you watch like a 20 minute youtube video it's like oh these are like as long as you think through it and like don't like watch someone build it first before you like glue things to things right. that you like shouldn't do or like <laughs> accidentally but it's always scary just i feel like yeah, it's crazy put, put that it's the thermal paste on the yeah. wrong side of the cpu <laughs> yeah the, just those few things that like when my computer breaks every now and again i'm just like oh my goodness i have to like hopefully repair this thing and like make sure that it works because it's also like the right. thing you use every day to like make sure it's like always running and it's like the nerdy version of like um car guys i feel like are like pc guys that like <laughs> yeah. have all these different parts that they really like and are always like tuning up their machines <laughs> True. 
I, I don't like RGB though. <laughs> yeah, mine doesn't do anything fancy. It's not like a gaming computer. It's just like a black box that sits down there. Yeah, do I, I really like like that. The first one uh, that I built, it's called Monolith because it's uh, like basically a black box. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any? Um, this is a question that I ask most people that come on. Is just like, do you have an Everest project or like a a big kind of goal that you like? kind of project that you would like to work on that you haven't or have you already worked on kind of a dream project that you want to talk about ah uh, that's a <laughs> it's a big question <laughs> big question yeah um let me think so like when i started out i really wanted to work in the movie industry mm -hmm. i really wanted to go and work on the next Lord of the Rings or on the next Matrix or something like that. But I like I had this realization that the the way the system works it's not for me because mm -hmm. like there's there's very little money involved for artists. You can make a living there, mm -hmm. but uh, there's like good uh, good evidence for that. But uh, Windows tells me I need some updates. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now, um, yeah, there's good evidence for that. There's certain artists that make, made it, uh, made a good living there. But on the other hand, um, there's like very, very little freedom in what you're doing. There's mm. like always trickles from the top down. Of course, it, as it should be, the, the director, if it's a good director, has a clear vision of what his movie should look like. And you're just a tool that has enough knowledge to produce that and mm -hmm. do that. And if you ask me that question 10 years ago, I would have told you, yeah, I want to work on the next Avatar movie or something. So, but right now I'm a bit of uh have a bit of a different opinion so i don't have like this mega project and mm -hmm. i have the feeling that some people because i'm working like uh, i had times where i produced a lot more output than nowadays because also i behind the scenes so to speak i work on on just client projects all the time mm -hmm. and don't have the time anymore and i have the feeling that some people speculate that i come up like suddenly turn out this like 30 minute short film that's huge and, <laughs> but uh yeah i have to disappoint you and say <laughs> that i'm not working on something like that even if i wish i would uh so to answer your question uh the thing that i really want to tackle is to actually work and live as an artist and not work for any clients or mm. any uh yeah commercial projects anymore so to have like the the same as back then when you when you really made it as a painter and could mm -hmm. live for your art or yeah. or with your art and uh, i think it's it's rather difficult nowadays uh, as a digital artist to do that mm -hmm. because uh, digital art is like uh like you can be replicate replicate <laughs> damn it <laughs> Rep replicated replicated yeah. yeah so but yeah there's this new thing that like this crypto art crypto thing. art yeah i was wondering Maybe, if that's it, yeah, yeah it, it got huge the last couple of days with people <laughs> but <laughs> But maybe that's something I could try and uh, yeah, at least just uh, get get to know and see if, if some, uh, that was something I uh, could make a living with or something. I don't know. Yeah, I know a fellow artist that we both know. I mean, Beeple was like a big one, but Cornelius was also another yeah, yeah. one that was like interesting um, to see go in that space because he also does more of these like big environmental things that are like take like a big amount of time and are like very like realistic um so it's interesting yeah. to see that mixed with the other art that's like a little bit more i don't know the correct but like every day which is just more a bit more abstract and less on like the visuals yeah and more i on think the like sometimes um, the 
the way the world works nowadays is a bit against uh, long-term projects mm -hmm. and they get a lot of attention while they are out but they get swept away by those the, the mass of yeah. all the other things quite quickly so mm -hmm. like back then when the third and the seven seventh came out it was a hot topic for quite a while because there was nothing else to sweep it away that quickly but nowadays you have your instagram feeds and mm -hmm. your twitter and stuff like that and yesterday there was a very nice video where someone recreated the math lab from breaking bad in 3d in oh, wow. really really high high detail and made like a montage of it yeah, and it's really, really great, and I really love to to see that because the shading is top notch and everything. It's like really, really great. But like he worked probably one year or half a year on that. Yeah. But like it, it's in in the sunshine for maybe in a week or something mm -hmm. like that, and then it gets swept under everything else that comes along. And that's what I. I wouldn't say criticize, but that's uh, very unfortunate for artists, that, especially uh, like Cornelius, that puts such a tremendous amount of work into one piece. Mm -hmm. And like, there's always this chance that this work like will be buried shortly after. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, he also got this um, piece that 20, uh, 52 hertz, where uh, that, that's still around so it's still a splash screen of the the yep. octane installer so <laughs> he he made a, a long-lasting uh impression with that one so mm -hmm. you never know and even like if um in terms of of artists i think the most known artists from like 200 years ago are the artists that constantly put out work they like you know maybe two works of them but they put mm -hmm. out 200 works and two of them just made it through the time so the chances are higher the more you produce mm -hmm. and i guess that's also speaking uh, for using like doing more faster turnaround projects but <laughs> i i'm not sure <laughs> that's kind of a big topic and like the world is turning twice the speed as it was like 10 years ago or even yeah. five years ago so even software there's like two releases every year nowadays so mm -hmm. yeah it's it's a it's a lot to keep up with and then yeah i think definitely. that a lot of people um kind of like people that start to chase the like photo realism it's like it is a little hard getting into because it does take so long to kind of like do all the steps that are required to like make a piece like you were calling like the tabletops but I think that, you know, if you're like gaining stuff from it, that should maybe be like, I've kind of had to split them in my head. Like there's things that are like concept is key in this one or like technical skill is key in this one. And it's like some of the, like, you know, a one for them, a one for you. So you can like keep putting out work to kind of stay right. relevant, but then also like put out stuff that you're like really interested that may take a little bit longer. Um, but I mean, you seem to still be putting out like, finding ways to like take your pieces and like maybe do like a breakdown on it and then like some quick tips and you've like been yeah, able to true. put out more content to like trickle out between the releases of like bigger things so was that like a more recent kind of thing um like a goal that you've been trying to do is like release more stuff well i it wasn't maybe it wasn't my goal but <laughs> i noticed that uh, it's it's sped up so much that like back then when i started maybe every, every like two months putting out something was quite fast in in the release cycle but mm -hmm. nowadays with dailies and everything <laughs> coming up it's awfully slow so my instagram is there dormant like for a couple of months until i <laughs> to put out my next next release or my next uh, picture so yeah i think that with the with the instagram uh stuff and that i switched automatically to something to like get uh get more out of one release so mm -hmm. uh, just do some small uh, animation for like what light i used or like the wireframe and maybe make a small camera animation through the scene stuff like that so yeah i mm -hmm. could could just spread the interest a bit more <laughs> but 
yeah also like a lot of those stuff was made because i noticed that on um what's it called behance on mm. behance uh, there's a lot more more views if you really deliver like information and yeah. more pictures than just your final render mm -hmm. and people seem to like it because it's sort of a breakdown you can see yeah. how the artist did it and i get it that some people that starting out or or are yeah not not as uh veterans in the in the scene they can find it daunting to look at this and <laughs> say how do you get all those details in but if you break stuff down mm -hmm. there's i don't know if there's this um saying in english too but we all cook with water uh, i don't <laughs> That's think a so German <laughs> saying yeah <laughs> so uh yeah we that means that like no matter what soup you're mm -hmm. getting or what meal you're getting it's just the basic ingredients it's just how you put them together and yeah. how you how careful you are with that mm -hmm. yeah and i think those breakdowns are nice i mean i remember like when i was just starting out like you're like how in the world like you don't even know how to start like achieving something at that like level of detail but like when people would put breakdowns just versus like the image you could like i would always like scroll in like 20 like 200 percent and be like what? Oh. yeah and like i think one of them even was like something that you would do where like you would scatter like hair across stuff right. as dust and i was like oh yeah that is a good idea but like you didn't have to like make a tutorial about it it's just like if people want to they can like really examine and like pick through like the wireframes and be like oh okay that makes more sense and i think for at least the realism stuff it's like good just to kind of show like a little peel back of the curtain and like just a little right. peek but you don't have to like go through like shader by shader and be like but you also kind of give i remember you did a couple packs of like just shaders that you would put out that were like pretty like normal like not like super like in context yeah. just like plastics but it was interesting to go through those like node graphs and be like oh this is like how you set up something and i've used those and like pulled the ideas into other things so i think that like a lot of it is like you also give back to the community if you like learn from the community and i think that that's like a cool thing that more people are doing now which is like this share of resources yeah. Yeah, for me, I always try to, I'm like more like the open source kind of minded <laughs> guy. Because also, um, like on the one hand, it's great to, to give back uh, mm -hmm. stuff that you uh, did and give back to the community. But also, of course, it's also promotion if you yeah. are known for, <laughs> oh, if you need free materials, just hop on this guy's page and download them. It's like maybe like every 10 people that land on the page just take a look around and see what you do mm -hmm. and maybe that <laughs> leads to something yeah. i don't know <laughs> but yeah it's it's always like taking and giving uh but yeah it's it's um when you when you have like um all this free stuff uh and you um, commercialize it you have to make sure it's up to date it goes yeah. through the latest version and stuff like that mm -hmm. so it's a lot of work so i don't want to do that mm -hmm. it's a lot <laughs> easier just to like give it away as is and then people yeah. can you know I, I mean i still get a lot of like emails where people are like it doesn't quite work with this and i was like i don't know it's free right. like <laughs> just like take it as it is um, right yeah my materials are, are getting quite old now i don't know i have to maybe make sure they are up to the new standards now <laughs> <laughs> yeah everything updates so quickly it's so hard to like keep That's things true. up to date um um are there any projects or personal projects or like um client projects that i guess not probably because of nda that you're like um want people to look out for that are coming up well the project i'm working on that will not surface until <laughs> like late next year so <laughs> yeah it's like it will be like there's uh, that's a project i'm working for i sponsor right now and mm. it's a film project and like because of COVID, there's like uh, the re rescheduling the the release and mm. stuff like that yeah. so <laughs> i don't think you should <laughs> wait and, and keep an eye out because you have forgotten by then <laughs> that that i said that so yeah but um 
hopefully um, when I'm when I'm done doing this project, not that I that I'm wary of it. It's <laughs> it's a great project, but uh, when I'm uh, finishing up this project, I'm having in mind doing some spare time work again, some something that will come out maybe at the beginning of next year or something. So yeah, you could look out for that <laughs> or just get surprised when it drops <laughs> in your feet. But uh, yeah, I have multiple ideas about what to do, but I'm not usually a person who wants to, to spoil is the wrong word, but to uh, go over the idea beforehand mm. because usually during the process, there's so much change yeah. uh, that people might might be offended. I don't know. <laughs> if, if Expecting offend, one thing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you, but nowadays, everyone is offended by anything, but yeah, so... <laughs> <laughs> they they're offended that the original idea had changed by then but yeah so because like there's this thing that i tried some sometimes um to make a um make a thread in some community and then <laughs> post the progress of uh of your work uh, every now and then and ask for feedback maybe but mm. everyone has their own idea right what this artwork could be at the end <laughs> so you get so much different feedback and some some sometimes there are trolls in there that just <laughs> spamming feedback yeah. that is not really even uh even uh good to to listen to so yeah i i tend to not do that anymore because i i did that twice and both of the times i felt like scrapping the project after a couple of, uh, of of posts because like there was so much going on and there's like discussions and everything and <laughs> I, I'm thinking okay I have this enough in my in my uh, commercial life I yeah. have to to do that with the, with the clients so when I have my spare time work I want to be at peace mm -hmm. and just have like in my head discussions with myself what to do and what not yeah yeah, sometimes yeah. design by committee is a lot more frustrating, especially when you're trying to do it for something that you have your own personal opinions on. Um, yeah. Uh, we had a question from Instagram that said, like, how do you sketch out your ideas for the scenes that you do? Is it like photo reference or do you actually like kind of think of it in your head or do you like draw it out or kind of what's your process mm, to like a good question. starting a project? So usually it starts out in my head when I, for example lay in my bed at night and then can't sleep so i <laughs> think about stuff that can be animated uh, or done to do a new cool project uh, and then i for like depending on how fast i have time to get creative with that project i keep it in my head for a couple of weeks and then sh refine stuff i have the rough idea and i start out with that and then I think maybe you could add an object like this there and like object like this there, uh, make the mood of the scene dark and then you need this and that lighting and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's how most of the stuff starts out. And then if, like depending on the complexity of the scene, I scribble down some possible perspectives for the scene and how to place objects because if it's in your head sometimes your head makes like unrealistic mm -hmm. stuff it's like you can't put this object next to that object uh, but your head doesn't tell you it's impossible mm -hmm. you have to sketch it out or <laughs> place it in your 3d scene to to notice and uh, yeah so uh, i i sketch it out sometimes sometimes i just start working on it and make it in, in 3d but i always keep it uh, like you would do it in real world so if you have like set dressing in a movie mm. you would go about and just build one prop after the other so for example for for my um keyboard scene i would go about and start with the smallest component that was important and that's one keycap so i i take one keycap model it look see if it looks good and put it on the keyboard or just like put it on like the grid of the keycaps and see if that looks good there. Then I put 
together the uh, base plate of the keyboard and so on and so the scene grows and mm. this is also the reason uh, where why scenes change because sometimes i do something especially with my with my artwork for the um still life i was very unhappy for the longest time because <laughs> stuff didn't work out well i have like modeled twice the uh, range of objects because <laughs> like I modeled it and shaded it put it in and it wasn't working maybe that's <laughs> a stupid thing to do but like sometimes there are projects where you can have in your mind really mm -hmm. clearly and you make it and just have to finesse stuff and it works perfectly but then you have those other projects where you put in the stuff and in your head it works and then yeah. you see it and you render and say well that looks like crap i have to <laughs> have to redo that and this and what a good workflow is if you have like your basic scene and cornelius also do, does that um i render uh, the scene out in high res every night or every every day at the end of my work with it and then i put it up on my 4k tv while lying in laying in bed <laughs> and stare at it for 15 minutes and i see all stuff that isn't right so just take your time stare at your work and see and look at every detail and of course at the beginning you see your your keyboard for example there and then think well maybe there might be a place for uh, a teacup or something like that there that you haven't planned and mm. and or you see something that's really shouldn't be there so intersections for example or something like that you need to repair or your mm. your keyboard is floating or something like that which can happen so that's my technique of getting getting the uh, the 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 details dialed in so every once in a while it ha doesn't have to be every day but <laughs> once in a while i make like very 4k renders of my current scene with the camera that i wanted to want to use at the end and then just look at them very long and intense and see is the lighting doing what i want could mm -hmm. it, would it be better to get more side lit would it be better to turn the keyboard a bit or stay let it stay that way or yeah, so just ask yourself questions after question. And I think that's the way also I get around the community uh, <laughs> community feedback because like I uh, really uh, intense, intensively um, deal with, with my own work. Mm. But yeah, so Cornelius also like flips it around from time to time to make his brain see a fresh picture because like if you flip your image you can yeah. you, you don't note or you notice new things that you didn't notice before stuff like that but it's like more valuable for works where you wor really work on long time and mm -hmm. i usually take up maybe one to three weeks or one to four weeks per per work of mine i'm not a too um long time worker i i would go, go crazy working like for six months or something yeah i i find that i get like very uninterested in like my own experiments pretty quickly so i have yeah. to like turn them out or else they'll just like go on the shelf and so mine's like i have to get it before like the interest in the project like runs out yeah so i've had to like speed up my workflow but for a long time i thought it was always just cool to like do like the two month long things of like just really intensely going in but i found that more and more my interest like dies off and then they just don't get finished. right so i have to like speed up the workflow now a lot faster yeah, either that or you find really something interesting that you yeah. can hold on to yeah um i think that we've got through all of the questions from instagram and the ones that i had so um i don't think that there's any more from the chat um is there anything else that you want to talk about not really <laughs> so i i always saw you your video feed so what you have uh, what's the thing you have framed in the behind you the, the, the electronic thing that's yeah, it's an old video oh, card or something yeah i can actually get it <laughs> it's
it's um it's from my wife it was um it's a graphics card and like the serial number is the day that we um got engaged yeah. or got married <laughs> so nice. yeah so this is like what sits up in my office it's a very right. old card that right. she like found and then it has um a bunch of other like little dates that matter like on little parts of it which was um cool but yeah it was so a, that that was coincidence that the date matched or the dates matched i think that this one was like uh, the date that matched was like um someone makes these and so they like put in like older right. parts and like kit bash it kind of together <laughs> but yeah it was it was a cool gift that she had gave that's me. funny yeah so it ties ties together <laughs> your yeah. uh, interest for computer yeah. to <laughs> your life basically yeah <laughs> yeah i still have my um my 780 around my old graphics card that <laughs> that one with the 1.25 <laughs> gigabytes <laughs> it's like in the shelf <laughs> yeah yeah i have like an entire bin full of like cuz i update stuff and the other stuff is just like doesn't fit in the computer so i just have a bin of like old right. electronics that i guess i could build like a like a low quality computer with <laughs> yeah I, I really wish that i kept something of the, some some parts of those because i had this really old computer i started out with it was my first computer it had like uh, intel what was the name of that uh it escapes me like some some very old processor and when like it was like one of those old computers where you have like two two megabytes of ram or something like that so uh when once i switched to newer one i disassembled it and had also my main board uh hung on the wall because i really mm. like that yeah. as a symbol it was like the first computer i had but then when i moved around so much i just it was like just uh, wasting space all the time so i threw it away and now mm. i regret it because mm. it was would be really nice to be have it yeah. still around <laughs> <laughs> that's cool um well thank you again for stopping by and doing this um it was nice to get to talk to you um finally face yeah, to face definitely. which was fun um everyone should go follow you if they haven't i assume everyone has um your handle is below your name right there um and then this will be up on youtube and I'll share that link out so that everyone can watch this on their own time and pause it and be able to get all the fun little information from it. But thank you again. Um, and then I think that that's everything for this. So bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. And thanks for having me. Really yeah. appreciate it. Definitely. See ya. <laughs> <laughs>